What's up, everyone? Uh, welcome to our webinar session with Tag Marshall, Thursday, August 10th. Um, for those that don't know, I'm Baxter Parrott. I'm the marketing director for the Southwest PGA. Um, Tag, Tag Marshall's a uh, proud and appreciated sponsor of the upcoming Pro Pro Torian uh, Golf Club. They're going to be on site. If anyone here is playing in that, Joey Walters is going to be there next Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, but I'm going to be handing it off uh, pretty soon here, just over to Bodo, kind of let him run through everything and um, walk you through their presentation today. We certainly appreciate Tag Marshall doing this and um, excited, uh, excited to hear the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you, Baxter. And thanks also for your partnership. We really appreciate you guys. And uh, I'm also very grateful that we have so many people dialing in. And uh, there's quite a few more that have um, registered but might not make the time. So we'll make sure to send you a recording. Uh, I am very grateful to have with us uh, Matt Kloppenberg from uh, Terra Vida Golf Club and David Hamilton, who is where are you at the moment, David? I never know. Charleston? I am, or I am in Charleston. I'm in Charleston, yeah. yeah. I'm glad I asked. Our VP of Business Development, uh, Jens. Thank you. Pleasure to have you guys. How are you? Good, Bodo. How are you? Um, brilliant. And uh, yeah, so our session today is uh, five ways Terra Vita Golf Club uses technology to improve the play experience by saving labor hours. They both are very topical. Um, my name is Bordo Sieber, the CEO of Tag Marshall, and uh, I am neither from Charleston nor from Augusta, as you can hear from my accent. I'm German born and raised, um, and I will try and keep us all on pace today. Um, let's jump in and meet uh, our expert panelist, Matt. Um, yeah, we're excited to have you. And uh, while we're looking at your amazing facility here, one of the um, Trune portfolio, uh, why don't you give us a quick introduction to Terravita and also your career and how you uh, got to be the PJ Head Golf Pro there? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to. Uh, to help tag Marshall out with this webinar. Um, as Bodo said, I'm the head golf professional at Terra Vida Golf Club. Uh, I've been here for two years. Uh, I've spent time in Colorado, um, uh, South Florida, and also the Wisconsin, Wisconsin section. Um, the golf course here at Terra Vida uh, was designed back in 1993 by Billy Casper and Greg Nash. Um, recently renovated this past year, 2022, uh, by Phil Smith. Um, and, you know, offers a variety of teeing grounds for all skill sets and handicaps. Um, we have in total 10 different teeing grounds uh, that includes combo tees. Um, so um, green size, as you can see, uh, fairly large, but um, really, really satisfied with the work that Phil Smith was able to do uh, in presenting the renovated golf course back to our membership. It does look amazing. Um, Matt, uh, you may not know that, but for a, a brief period in time, every single Tag Marshall customer was a Packers fan. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, we started our uh, journey with um, yeah, some of the more well-known Wisconsin clubs. And the first one was Aaron Hills, the next one was Wisconsin Straits, and then we moved our way south. And now we're working with um, just over 500. Um, which brings me to um, one of our yeah, uh, esteemed colleagues from our business development team. David, why don't you do a quick introduction on yourself? Because you're quite recent, yeah. Uh, yeah, re recently joined us. Yeah, so I, I've had the privilege to have been in this uh, industry that we all love for 30, 30 plus years, spent uh, 20 plus years with Club Car in a senior management position, transitioned to a company called Integra, which is a group purchasing organization. And uh, Bodo and I connected last year and started having some conversation and uh, I was privileged and, and proud to become part of this team and kind of joined in March of this year. So can't uh, very proud to be working with Bodo and alongside our amazing team, you know, to drive sales and drive awareness and, and really bring this technology into into um, position here. So really glad to have Matt here today and get a chance to hear it purely from an operator's perspective. 
Um, indeed, indeed. Thank you, David. Um, Matt, uh, we had to learn from you and uh, you're very glad that you're happy to share some of your insights. Um, before we go there, uh, because obviously we want to stay up to date as to what's happening, uh, David and I were at a National Golf Course Owners Association event recently, and the NGF, the National Golf Foundation, shared some data with us um, that we thought you'd all appreciate. David, won't you talk us through that there quickly? Yeah, I think, uh, but as you said, we were both privileged enough to be there and hear Greg Nathan, who is the president and the COO of the National Golf Foundation, really talk through these numbers. And if you look at them, this was a kind of a 2021-2022 comparison but the, the unbelievable part of this is if you think about going back to the evolution of the, the top golfs and the drive shacks and, and what they term as kind of off course. And by that, uh, I think it's important to outline that they, they look at off course as real club, real ball, real swing. So not some of the putting concepts like putting world that's in the Scottsdale market, but you know basically people that are getting out there as an entry level. And I think if you look at you know, the average age and the generation that this is attracting, the percentage of female and diversity that it's attracting, the affluence that it's attracting, it's pretty incredible. You know, if you think about this almost being a feeder system to people that probably were more intimidated for getting on the golf course the first time. And I know, Matt, we talked about this a little bit in regard to someone coming out and being a little intimidated, not knowing where to go, not necessarily knowing where to start and being comfortable. This kind of gives them that entry into the uh, into the sport, into the industry. And, and the numbers really, you know, kind of spell it out. And Bodo, if you'll go to the next slide, I think it's interesting to see that year over year. I mean, think about literally an increase of almost 4 million players year over year. Um, and the numbers going up in every category, specifically off course. So now you got off course being a higher percentage of female, higher percentage of non-white, higher percentage of and, and driving a higher percentage of that, that affluence, so to speak. So 25% increase over five years is uh, pretty impressive. So something we can all be proud of and, and be excited about, I think the passion for our sport. I fully agree where with you, Matt, we probably profiled you somewhere in that uh, <laughs> illustration. <laughs> uh, what, there, is your, yeah. what is your sense? And are you seeing any of that uh, flow through um, onto the interest that you're getting, maybe some of the guests play, maybe some new members that are looking to join? Yeah, I think that's uh, what David said was spot on. And, and we as operators um, sometimes have to think outside the box and in, in how we can attract um, new individuals to our sport um, because it's come a long way and it continues to adapt and change uh, through technology, through uh, instruction, um, whether that be social media, videos, what have you. Um, and any way that we can find a niche to market ourselves a little bit differently, but still share the message and get that out to our current membership, but also those that may be looking to potentially join a private club, I mean, I'm all ears. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. you you mentioned uh, an important variable here, and that's technology, right? Because that top golf experience is technology enabled. There's gamification. It's a shorter format. It's it's easy to um, to just get into it. Uh, so we can expect that this uh, um, cohort of potential players, which is clearly there's latent demand here, it's also the reason why. Callaway was so eager to invest in this uh, gig. Um, if there's one thing that these guys would probably want uh, coming onto the golf course, right? And that's those aspects, shorter formats, technology enabled gamification, all those things. Um, and it's great uh, to see that um, yeah, golf is open, open-minded uh, to um, giving that a go. And uh, yeah, in part, that's the reason why, why we're here, right? So uh, bringing technology into the game. Uh, David, want you do a quick introduction into what we do at Tag Marshall? Yeah, I, I think uh, when you see this slide, to me, it really it brings a lot of pride. Number one, just if you think about the evolution and uh, what you guys have accomplished since roughly 2017, you know, over 30 million rounds tracked, over a trillion data points collected, 500 plus golf courses that we're working with today, and you know, a, a great, I think the other cool thing is the cross-section of private, daily fee, municipal, and just organizations as a whole that we're crossing over. So we're not just for the higher end. I like to say we're 
we appeal to a $600 plus green fee and we appeal to a $50 and under green fee, which is a, which is a really nice position to be from a technology company. And uh, we, we've built a great solid portfolio of, of clients and uh, continue to drive and get and and see the value and, and enjoy things like this, because I think, you know, hearing it straight from, from Matt's perspective really kind of puts a light on it. That's uh it's not just a, a selling point. It's it's real life experience and a value proposition that he's seeing. Yeah, and, and to your point, David, I think uh, we we are very blessed to work with some of the very best in the industry, and obviously also learning from them, and to have multi year uh, relationships with many of them, and uh, that is really what fuels our innovation, um, and keeps us uh, pushing um, to make our solution better so that we can add more value. And and I remember recently we had a, a team workshop and it was the Genesis Scottish Open and somebody somebody casually mentioned oh did you guys know that we're tracking that very the event that we're watching it's like no like we'd, some of them had forgotten about it but uh, we just seem to be um, getting more and more out there which is obviously delightful for me um, having been one of the people that started uh, Tag Marshall but uh, Matt going back to you um, yeah important question obviously we're all in the service industry right and we're providing a, a golf product uh, um, and the question is what makes or breaks a player experience and maybe also thinking what has got, uh, what impact has golf uh, golf's growth and the um, high volume of play had on this um, what would you say out of this list of six or seven um, higher order uh, variables what are the top three or four that you would say make or break the play experience um, I mean, besides the fact that that last screen showcased uh, a lot of very desirable and well-known clubs, um, I think that Tag Marshall's uh, put forth a product that uh, seems to work really well, as David put, for the high end all the way down to the municipal daily fee, $50 round uh, facilities. Um, for us, more specifically, you know, we're a little bit more unique where um, 500 golfing members, 70% um, of our golfing members have private carts that they can use out on the golf course. Um, so with that said, my fleet um, is only 30 carts deep. Uh, and so the ability to, to improve on pace of play or track um, or use geofencing or something like that uh, is not necessarily realistic for the amount of uh, private cart volume that we have on the golf course. And so um, just tying into the player's experience, you know, one that is truly true to our hearts is is certainly the pace of play uh, and the flow of that. Um, certainly the accessibility and tee time availability. Um, you know, in our markets, uh, the high season is truly November to April. Uh, we fight, you know, daylight, which we can't control um, every year in that time frame. Uh, and all 500 or so golf members are back during that time frame wanting to play golf five to six to seven days a week. And so um, course access and the tee sheet demand is is um, is challenging. And so any way that we can tie in course access and improve upon pace of play, uh, I'm all ears. And we struggled with that prior to my arrival. Um, and so that was part of uh, a project that I had to work through and and, and really do some, some data driven research uh, to find out ways to improve upon that. Um, but certainly the last two, um, I mean, I could probably go through the entire list, but uh, the last two um, course conditions are always important for our members. Um, the experience that they get bringing out guests on our golf course day in and day out. Uh, and then obviously the golf course uh, was recently renovated. Uh, it was an eight and a half million dollar project that uh, the membership is ecstatic about. Um, and uh, it, it's been it's been wondrous uh, to see its transition um, since its uh, creation back in 1993. Uh, that must have been an amazing um, opportunity to be part of that uh, from, from your point of view. Obviously, you've, um, having been around uh, the, the club uh, not too long before that, uh, just to see it go from being a good club to being or a, probably a great club um, would have been quite cool. Um, but you mentioned course conditioning, which obviously in the Arizona area is uh, um, a little bit uh, more difficult than elsewhere because uh, you obviously have uh, you know, some water restrictions and quite tough terrains and climatic conditions. So uh, hats off to your um, superintendent and, and his team for doing what looks to be an, an amazing job. Um, 
Yeah, but jumping into what the research says here, because obviously we're data people and we want to uh, base uh, what we do on data wherever possible. So in, indeed, the course conditioning trumps that comes out top when you ask the players, and this was a, a large scale USGA survey that they did um, a while ago, and they asked the players, so what are the critical enjoyment factors for you? And 82% uh, of them said course conditioning. And then in between that is actually uh, playing partners in my group, um, which also goes down to accessibility, uh, I suppose. And, but 74% of players saying the pace, the flow, the time it takes to play is crucial uh, to their enjoyment. And uh, moreover, more recently, the NGCOA um, and the USGA did a combined research project where they asked operators, so what do you see as crucial? And again, the pace was a top three factor um, where 84% of operators are now saying that uh, this is something to focus on. So it's, uh, it's important. I think that we also acknowledge that uh, golf has had an amazing boost uh, but time is such a precious commodity, right? And uh, we have to just uh, value that aspect. And also, if people make the time to go play, they want a good flow and no stop um, round wherever possible. And then if you give that to them, they'll always come back and uh, and play more golf at your club. Um, yeah, let me just jump ahead. There's a bit more research here from the USGA that uh, that is quite interesting. Uh, but uh, before I do, um, Matt, uh, uh, you being part of the Truen portfolio, I know that you tuned into quite a bit of technology and uh, um, measuring how your club is uh, perceived and received is, is important. Um, so the NPS and Net Promoter Score is that something that you measure, um, and and how do you how do you do that? How do you get feedback? Yeah, we uh, we measure that actually um, daily, uh, weekly, monthly, yearly. Uh, we use a member insight tool uh, that tracks this data. Um, using our uh, Jonas software system, we're able to actually um, run a random 20% of the T-sheet tied in with those that actually make live transactions in the golf shop on any given day. Um, and they're sent out every night a brief five question survey uh, based and, and basically ask them about their recent golf experience uh, at Terra Vida or their recent uh, shopping experience. So, um, you know, and it covers anything from the pace of play uh, to the golf course conditions to uh, how they were greeted um, at their arrival and how they were uh, they were sent off on their their fond farewell after the round. So um, it's the little things like that that matter for us. Uh, to improve each day um, on the member experience um, and whatever we can do to accomplish and be better. Um, we're, we're, we're all for it. Sure. Yeah, it must be such a great tool for you to have as manager, right? Uh, because you can only have your eyes in so many uh, corners of your club and, and you can only see so many rounds and so many interactions, but uh, to really have that uh, spot check come back on a regular basis uh, must be great. And I think that in the past, maybe operators were guilty of waiting for complaints, you know, right before they um, checked, uh, can we improve? Um, and that uh, really, I think in, in today's world where experience is everything um, is something that you know, we can no longer afford. Uh, but going back to this research, so this is from the uh, Golf Innovation Symposium. And uh, what was shown there was that um, the pace of play has uh a really um, incredible and material impact on the net promoter score. Uh, so again, um, to remind you all, the net promoter score is when your airline or your restaurant uh, or Terra Vita asks you, how do you rate your experience out of 10, where 10 is I was delighted and zero is like, this was terrible, I never come back here. And um, what they're finding is that naught to three is very bad. Um, four to seven is sort of in the middle and very often people that feel like that don't actually even respond it's just not quite I'm not quite angry I'm not, and I'm not delighted so I'm not even going to give it the two minutes and anything eight to ten that's a net promoter that's somebody who says good things about um, about your business and uh, those are the people that will advocate and that will come back and also they're more likely to spend more money and they're also more likely to forgive you if you've made a mistake so that's all based on research but uh, what it shows is that if there's medium to good flow the net promoter score is always high if it's bad no matter what else you've done well it drops rock bottom and and uh, 
Matt, you, you said it like you need to do the little things well, right? Do the basics really well. If players feel welcome, if there's a good flow, if they meet people out on the on on the course and they feel looked after, um, the net promoter score is really high, and the restaurant visit percentage goes up, which is obviously a, a revenue and a, a service opportunity. And if those things aren't done well, the net promoter score drops rock bottom, and also the restaurant visits percentage goes down. People just leave. Um, so it's uh, it pays to do this well, and and obviously also pays to uh, to keep ourselves in check. Um, are we delivering? And I think uh, that's probably a good segue to jump into um, how you at Terra Vita have invested in technology. You mentioned uh, you were tasked with getting some real data um, and some real insights. And here's a nice little quote from uh, Peter Drucker, uh, who's a, you know, a really well-known management thinker. And what he said, what gets measured gets managed. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. Um, so uh, to that uh to that point, how is Terra Vita using technology to optimize pace and field flow, and how is that improving the play experience? So let's yeah. jump into uh, what this looks like for you, and maybe you can just talk uh, to the technology a little bit before we look at a, a live screen of what your team looks at. Yeah, absolutely. And if Bodo, you want to chime in on and talk about any uh, the two-way mobile device that I'll speak to, because um, that one on the far left, I guess the second icon in, um, is a device that we went with because it made the most sense um, having a smaller fleet, um, having a lot of private carts. It's a mobile device. It can be passed out to walkers, pull carts, uh, golf carts with mounts. Um, and so that one made the most sense for us uh, because it still does offer the ability to use GPS. Uh, it has Golf Genius integration uh, for a lot of events that we run uh, here at the club. Uh, but then also has the ability um, to obviously showcase where potentially other groups are out on the golf course at any given time. Um, and so, you know, the, the biggest thing that we were tasked with um, is truly our demand uh, on the tee sheet in the high season um, and combating pace of play and making sure that, uh, you know, in the, in the middle of January, if uh, the daylight only allows for an eight o'clock start time all the way to a one o'clock start time to finish 18 holes, we want to make sure that that person teeing off at one o'clock um, gets their 18 hole round in and isn't fighting daylight. And well, you know, it can be truly affected by the flow of pace out on the golf course for that day. Um, and, you know, we didn't really have any data to go off of uh, prior to my arrival. And, uh, you know, what we would do is we would send marshals around the golf course periodically throughout the day. Um, you know, we had our uh, cheat sheet with the timestamps for the, the tee off times for each pairing group and when they should complete each hole by. Uh, but as you can imagine, you know, we can't be in, you know, a hundred different places at one time out on the golf course tracking each round and each turn time. Um, and so we would hit a handful of spots. We'd be able to you know, see groups falling behind or we get phone calls in from other members playing behind slower groups or what have you. Um, what Tag Marshall was really able to do for us, um, being a unique club that we are, um, is really see the trends before they kind of balloon out of control. Um, and so when we start to see the groups start to slow or lose some speed out on the golf course and maybe the, the gauntlet stretch, um, the furthest out portion of the golf course, you know, it, uh, it allows for the staff to be Johnny on the spot, get in the Marshall card, you know, make a sweep through that, uh, that group, see how everything's going, but then also reinforce uh, and, and communicate a message uh, that that group has been spoken to, to groups subsequently behind them. Yeah, I think um, you, you make a, a great point is firstly, with art technology, you're forever chasing your tail, right? And, and, and you have enough to do as it is. Um, so not often that you can actually make a priority to get out there. And also it's so time consuming uh, right. to try and uh, make sense of it. Um, David, from, from your side, and obviously you've uh, you know, had quite a bit of experience and I've seen um, the system in action at quite a few places. Can I ask you to do a, a very uh, brief one minute nutshell of the other options that uh, some clubs might be using and also... I just want to note that uh, Scott is, I think, on this webinar from uh, Gold Canyon, and they went with um, yeah, our, our 8-inch install version for their fleets. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. But, uh, so if you look on the far left, it's just a, a basic tag tracking mechanism that could be um, could put on a caddy bib if you have caddies. It could be attached to a golf bag for walkers only. The two-way handheld mobile just right to the right of that that uh, Matt referenced is really kind of a mini GPS screen. And it's a, it's a handheld version of the eight inch, which is mounted directly to the golf car. So the eight inch is a screen that mounts directly to the golf car, gives full GPS technology, geofencing, two-way communication, you know, the ability to be able to show pace of play, um, the ability to be able to, to see that gap interval on the golf course. And then just to the right of that is what we call our classic tag, our classic uh, mobile install device. So that mounts under the seat of a golf car, doesn't have a screen that, you know, is for a private club. They may or may not want a screen referenced on their car. Some privates prefer not to have the screen, but they need the data and they need the tracking and the geofencing and all the related technology. So, you know, I think the nice thing about this portfolio is that we really have an offering for every scenario, depending upon how your club is set up and how you operate your club and where your preferences are. To the far right, you'll see kind of that the Marshall tablet that we offer our clients. So to Matt's point, the, the Marshall has the ability to have a tablet. They can go out on the golf course. They can have that fact-based data that they can have a, an intelligent, we like to call non-emotional conversation. So it, it's, it doesn't become confrontational. Um, it's not calling someone slow. You basically can say, hey, you're a little bit out of position. You're starting to have an impact on the golf course behind you it would really help us if you could pick it up just a little bit. Um, you can also communicate with other players to know that you're addressing that situation and that way the phone's not ringing in the golf shop. You know, Matt staff is not getting phone calls about a group that's, that's holding up the pace of play. The far right is what we call our data analytics hub and that's really kind of the um, the repository for everything. So that's from an operator perspective, from Matt's role, from his team's role, has the ability to see all of the related data and really kind of synopsize it right there in front of you. And the cool thing about this, all web-based, everything basically, you can access this data from a, a phone, a tablet, um, a PC, a laptop. So it, uh, a lot of versatility in that respect. Um, uh yeah, I know in the, in the most simple form, um, it's been described as the ways or Google Maps of the, the traffic on the golf course. Matt, do you think that's uh, appropriate? <laughs> yeah, I think that that's spot on. You know, it's uh, probably one cause for concern that our membership had when we were socializing. Tag Marshall was uh, that the golf staff now has uh, kind of the all seeing eye and they're just going to watch <laughs> us and see where we're at on the golf course, which um, I guess that's slightly accurate to a certain degree, but that's certainly not the way that we use the technology. Um, I think David said it best where, you know, the, the non-emotional message that we have to have in our roles is uh, talking to the slow groups out on the golf course. Well, in part, it's in the messaging, but also uh, the more crucial part is being able to showcase the data and truly showcase to them, hey, this is where the group is at in front of you. Here's where you're at. You're plus 15. I mean, we need to bridge the, bridge that gap, you know, for a lack of better words. So, um, you know, it's kind of twofold from that regard, but it's certainly uh, calmed a lot of our members, um, and and they've uh, they've grown to really appreciate and be very knowledgeable of uh, of their pace while while out there on the golf course. Yeah, yeah, I think one of the big factors is that you can um, obviously gathering that you can also communicate that with your member base, right? And and very often they then take a lot of pride. Are we getting better? You know, like has it been a a fast Saturday again and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, but uh, so so this is actually a snapshot of Terra Vita, and you can already see that this is uh, quite a vast uh, operation. Um, lots of residential in between, um, not, not easy to uh, get from one side to the to the to the other. Uh, Won't you give us a quick um, walk through? This is obviously a, a fictitious uh, story, but uh, this might happen. And uh, yeah. what does your team see, and how would they now respond to uh, to what they can see? But you must remember that most of the people on the webinar, uh, yeah, uh, for them it's new, so. Um, yeah. explain it to us like we're eight years old. 
<laughs> yeah. So if I'm looking at this snapshot, um, it's showing me that, you know, we have obviously uh, all the all the circles with the numbers inside of them are all the tags out of the golf course. Um, green is obviously good. Uh, yellow is getting a little bad. Um, you know, red and pink are obviously the worst. Um, so trying to keep everything in the green is obviously what we uh, we shoot for. Um, with that said, you know, our footprint kind of up near that big circle um, player that's a little X'd out at the top right of the screen. That's really where the uh, golf shop, uh, cart barn, bag room is at. Um, so with our footprint, you know, we essentially have, uh, you know, it's a five to sometimes 10 minute drive in a golf cart to get yourself out to uh, tag number 18 or 17 that are on hole number five out there uh, on the far left. So um, seeing that, recognizing that, uh, being able to communicate that, you know, they are in fact off pace by X amount, uh, bridge that gap, try to catch it up with uh, tag number 16 right there, who's obviously in green. Um, but then also being mindful of the other backlogs uh, that are happening out on the golf course, you know, with that, uh, you see one on the nearing the green of number 10 in tag number 13, uh, and then also uh, on the green of hole 14 in tag number six. So um, doing our best to manage, you know, obviously we're driving the golf course in reverse. So, you know, hole nine back to hole one, checking on all groups. But uh, when we see those problem childs um, out on the golf course, you know, we're trying to figure out, you um, easier ways to navigate and be out of sight, out of mind and get out to them as quickly as possible uh, to, to get them expedited. Yeah, I think, Matt, the one thing that jumps out at me here is, is just the vastness of your property and the size and scope of what you have to deal with. And, and as you can, as you've mentioned earlier, just the efficiencies of being able to go directly to the bottleneck, directly to the source of the problem, as opposed to riding the golf course and trying to figure out where that bottleneck is. Yeah, that's so, right. Um, Matt, I know that you have a, a T sheet. Obviously, at this point, probably ninety five percent of the industry does. Um, it is twenty twenty three after all, but uh, you've got it integrated into Tag Marshall, and uh, that means that you know, um, you know, who's in the group. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about collecting data on individual players in just a minute. Uh, but yeah, hard. So now you know. Okay, this is group number seventeen. They're out of position. You're your on-course staff now hits the button and they know exactly when did they start, how far out are they right now, what's their progress been the last few holes. Um, they, they might uh, now leave a note um, uh, for uh, the late part of the day um, where hopefully this group is back on track, but they might not be. Uh, so how is it helpful uh, for you uh, to have uh, the, the name assignment and that uh, that integration with the T-sheet? Uh, I mean, it's unique and flawless and every other really good adjective that I could use because um, every night when um, or I, I should say that uh, you know every morning when we open up the t-sheet in the 40s um, you know essentially all those names are integrated and plugged into tag marshal and all we're then going and doing is assigning the tags you know starting with either number one or you know number 15 or number 26 or whatever it is um, and just going straight down the t-sheet so um, the reality is, is when you see kind of how they're assigned on, on this day, you know, it looks to me like probably uh, we started with tag number one, which is on the green or fairway of hole 18, and then snaked all the way back to like, it looks like the last tag off for at this period in time is tag number 22. So uh, we can kind of see the flow and then really just, you know, Truly, if we didn't have the software in front of us, look at the T sheet and be able to understand, you know, first pairing group is tag number one, all the way down to tag number 22. Uh, but, you know, clicking on the tag and being able to see the players in the group um, is super beneficial because uh, at the end of the day, too, when we are able to uh, really dive deeper and better into the data, we can figure out really quickly who those variables are. Uh, or those slow members, um, because, you know, their name is always plugged in, but the pairing group may be changing. And so we can decipher that and say, you know, uh, Mike Smith, who's in this tag number 17, you know, Mike Smith over the last 30 days have, has played this uh, golf course in, you know, four and a half hours. 
uh, versus the rest of those other guys in that group, you know, they fluctuate between four and a half and four ten. So it tells me that, uh, you know, Mike's got uh, something to work towards. <laughs> Uh, nicely put. Uh, we'll, we'll talk to the um, player profiles in just a minute. Uh, but uh, um, you can also see that in the split between the two nines here that uh, you ran uh, double T starts um, at the height of your season. Yeah, wh why don't you just uh, talk a little bit to that and, and what um, uh, what you've learned about it. And maybe if I can ask um, our audience by if you type into the chat, um, a one, if you don't do double T starts and a two, if you do, I just, so we get a bit of a reading, that'd be nice. Um, type away, um, Matt, uh, I don't know, that has Cheravita always done this or is it something that you started experimenting with and, and is it working for you guys? Uh, yeah, they had, they had briefly started it before my arrival. Um, we, we, we continued the tradition, if you will, um, but we're able to, manage it a little bit more effectively um, uh, in the last two years or so. Um, we figured out really quickly that uh, Fridays are our busiest day on the golf course. Um, everybody's looking to play. Um, you know, they want to play often and frequent. And, and therefore, in order to potentially pick up, you know, a handful more tee times for that day, running a double tee start, um, starting, we usually target uh, the end of December, uh, and run that through roughly March or so, because we know that we picked back some daylight up uh, in March. But, uh, you know, for the, the the seasons in the winter that we fight daylight, uh, we want to get the most golfers out on the golf course. Uh, we want to obviously improve upon pace of play. Uh, we do run a double T start on Fridays, um, which, um, you know, with, with the tags that we use, the two-way mobiles, um, we have the ability to have, you know, our starter box, which is located near uh, closer to the number one tee. Uh, and then we have kind of a, a, a hybrid sort of makeshift starter box that we position on the backside of 18 because hole number 10 is just around the corner there. Um, and so we're able to divide the tags uh, in half, pass them out uh, as groups uh, make their way to the, the first or 10th tee. Um, and then also manage the flow um, because those those people are in place to see when players are either coming up nine or coming up 18 uh, and then communicate that appropriately. Now, we can obviously see it as well um, on our uh, iPads uh, that the staff walks around with to, to, to view the course map. Uh, but it's just another second set of eyes to to make sure that if, you know, we had one more group that needed to tee off on number one uh, before that group on 18 made the turn, um, you know, we could kind of hold them up a little bit, you know, scrub the clubs a little bit more efficiently on the backside of 18 and then, and then send them off uh, on their merry way to hold number one. So. Sure. Um, so we, we've done quite a lot of research into this um, as a capacity gains opportunity and, and uh, for certain clubs and the key uh, is here, like obviously how um, similar from a um, time par do your two nines play. Um, and also how long is your golf course and uh, if, funny enough it's too sh if it's too short it doesn't really work uh, but yours is uh, right within the sweet spot so it's a nice capacity gain opportunity but you have to manage things uh, with double vigilance almost right because uh, yeah, right. if you if your one nine really uh, drops out by uh, 30 40 minutes then it impacts um, twice the amount of players um, as the, as the uh, the front line catches up um, but yeah, good uh, good for you that you that you got it down, and I'm sure that uh, your members appreciate that uh, you can get more play out, especially when the demand is so high. And you mentioned Friday's your big day, yeah. So what's a, a very busy day look like in terms of players out for you? Uh, Num Fridays is five. usually uh, 240 to 260 um, players, um, and you know we can sometimes depending upon the time of year. You know, it can either start right around the eight o'clock time frame or it goes to potentially, I mean, if we're fighting frost, it's, you know, usually a hour and a half or two hour delay. Um, but it's right in the eight o'clock to the latest we probably get from a first tee start is uh, 830 time frame or so. How do you mean frost? Isn't it always 100 degrees where you guys are? 
<laughs> oh gosh, not in the desert. We get some, uh, you know, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, so I know cold, but uh, we get some cooler mornings uh, in the winter season in the desert where it starts off uh, below freezing, uh, but progressively works towards the 65, 75 degree days. Not, not for the not for the faint hearted. Um, uh, Matt, you mentioned the player profiles over time, uh, obviously accumulating information. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, how you may or may not use this in your 40s lottery when it comes to you know the, the critical tea times. And also, um, the Phil Mickelman name here is chosen by our designer, who's got a sense of humor. <laughs> um, he's, he's a gambler. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, talk to us about um, yeah how you uh, what you're learning here, and and then um, does this ever influence your your lottery? Yeah, it certainly does. Uh, it's really um, an awesome data point for us to be able to see that common variable across multiple pairing groups and and who, um, which in, in this instance, uh, Phil Mickelman uh, is clearly that individual. Um, but uh, being able to showcase time uh, spent over that number of rounds on pace, uh, a delay or delayed or even just flat out slow. Um, and so we'll look at that stuff. And, you know, I, I, I have a really good sense for uh, out of the 500 golfing members that we have uh, who those common variables are. Um, and uh, it may may or may not play a little bit of influence into their uh, their lottery time at a given day. Uh, but, uh, you know, we certainly look at the uh, the more uh, compacted days, i.e. the Friday days. Uh, where pace is truly that much more crucial. Um, and I can't afford to allow the uh, the membership or the operation to shoot themselves in the foot and uh, um, have a have a really slow group leading the pack uh, right off the bat. Sure, it's a it's a great a good decision, right? Um, and uh, you, you don't have to share all your secrets with with uh, with everybody. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's jump on uh, because obviously the play experience is one thing, but you also have your hands full um, running a, a busy operation with uh, you know limited resources. So the question is, what has the impact been on your efficiency and how is your team using technology and data to save time and also money? Yeah. Um, yeah. What uh, What's the feedback? I don't know what the next screen is. Okay, we'll, we'll talk to a Golf Genius, but just in general, like, is that working um, to uh, and com comparable to how things used to be with before you had the technology? Um, yeah, are you I mean, more efficient think, and uh, is it saving you money? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's obviously, um, it's definitely saving us money, you know, before um, having this um, potentially employ uh, multiple starters um, or multiple rangers uh, to police traffic out in the golf course. Um, it allows for us to utilize more of the professional staff um, and and work more effectively, you know, almost smarter, not harder, uh, and managing the flow out on the golf course um, uh, on a day to day basis. Um, but then, you know, obviously, with how busy and active our membership is, you know, we'll speak to this in probably just a second. But uh, the integration with Golf Genius uh, and some of the other features that Tag Marshall has to offer. Um, you know, we're probably, um, you know, we're, we're kind of taking the walk before you run approach uh, with this software. Um, but you, I firmly believe that in the next handful of years, uh, we will start to uh, chip away at more of the offerings that Tag Marshall has to offer, i.e. the um, the the thermal um, imagery um, for the course map from an irrigation standpoint uh, or from a uh, blocking sort of entry and exit points um, where the heavy trafficked uh, the golf carts flow um, all the way to the uh, the food and beverage components. So um, for right now, the the software that we use in Tag Marshall works really well for um, weekly tournament play, pace of play, um, and and allowing the staff to uh, be that much more knowledgeable on all the data uh, that we can speak to uh, in. You know board meetings or what have you um yeah here's uh one other uh 
piece of information that's available um, within the system. So this is what we call a track map. And uh, it's basically a, a history of everything around that gets played. Um, and the, the nice thing here is that you have uh, the information of the entire round. Um, and these dots uh, obviously are sort of timestamps as the groups uh, pass through their round. Um, and you can see when they finished, who was in the group. So we, if there's ever a post round conversation that needs to be had. Um, that is certainly helpful because without data and having a, a steam steaming angry member come in and tell you that the round took five hours and it was terrible is not an easy conversation to have. Uh, so this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, very helpful here. And, and also uh, what your team does uh, really well, uh, Matt, is uh, to just to, to keep track of the interactions they have on the course. Um, here's an example. So the message was, uh, you're currently six months behind pace with an entire hole open at front. Please continue to merge and try and catch up. And, and this is, uh, it can't be argued with, right? Uh, but I think you mentioned earlier the positioning is, is uh, 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 constructive and um, your team hasn't said you're slow which right. is something that uh, is like a lead balloon when it comes to players right and I think um, you know that's that shows that your team's really dialing into it and uh, they probably got this group um, almost back in where you wanted them and not having as much impact um, onto the tail of, uh, of of groups behind them um let's uh let's jump into the the broader data here so this is um a month uh, um at the course and you can see with all of these green bars those are the individual days um tracking towards uh, a target goal time that is at 490 and here you've got a uh, different goal time set for for certain days um and normally you would uh, want to play towards 410 but your average time comes in at 411 and you bring um, this entire month through at 74% on pace. And if you're adding the 10 minutes, 10 minutes variable above what on pace means, then you're at 85%. So this looks like all the effort that you're putting in is, is paying off. Um, talk to us a little bit about, a bit about how you use this data to you know, cross-check um, if you're um yeah if you're on track and also um how that helps your incremental improvement initiatives yeah it's something that i i probably look at uh once a month uh and report back to my golf committee uh to showcase to them you know this is kind of where we're trending this is where we can be better uh but certainly you know the dividends have paid off uh for us in you know we we have a probably a vast majority of the members um, that that firmly believe that this golf course could be played in four hours and under. Um, and then some that argue that, you know, they, you know, the aging membership, uh, the time spent on the golf course needs to be a little bit more. Um, you know, these are great data points for me to showcase across the entire year or entire month or week or what have you, uh, what the average pace of play truly was. And, and it, and it goes, um all the way built into if there are days where we're truly car path only and seeing what those uh pace to play rounds actually look like um but uh then it then it helps the conversations like i just had with our golf committee um unveil and say you know we want to shoot to be better we want to improve upon pace to play that much more which then turns around and allows for that many more pairing groups and players to complete an 18 hole round of golf by X time in the high season when they normally wouldn't be able to. Um, and so that's really a lot of the data that I was able to pull and showcase to the um, to the golf committee and then on to our board of directors that, you know, this is this is obviously possible. Um, and, you know, it's it's truly in the messaging um, and, you know, the the communication out to our members to showcase to them that, you know, taking sort of incremental gains um one week to one week or month to month or year to year um uh, we can we can progressively get that much better um and, and allow for more golfers to uh to play around a golf on any given day um down here you is your whole stats so that's your runtime per hole and what it shows is the time on uh, the tee box the time in the fairway the time on the green where obviously the tee box wait time normally is the clincher when it comes to what a bad flow means uh, but uh, yeah you can see that uh, most of your holes 
I mean, it, it's very unforgiving in that it goes red when it's five seconds over. Right. Uh, but um, I believe once you've had some data tracked, uh, you actually looked at um, yeah, just uh, tightening some of those. Um, I, what are the learnings that you've taken out of just having this data tracked for almost the entire season now? Um, honestly, you, you guys have uh, you've covered a lot, and uh, you know there's so much data and so many different reports that are uh, built into Tag Marshall that I can utilize. That I'm still. I'm still feeling like I'm scraping the surface on on what all I can wrap my brain around and uh, communicate out to the proper channels and um, you know showcase to them you know those incremental gains or abilities you know if we can move this to you know five seconds faster well guess what that turns around and improves this 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 and this so um, all of the all of the features in the software have worked wonders for our operation. Uh, because it was unlike anything that we really had before. Um, there's a question that was posted here. Um, the beverage cart has an impact on the pace of play. So does the service of the beverage cart outweigh the inconvenience of slow play? And maybe, um, David, because you are such a frequent beverage cart customer, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Do you want to have a go? And how would you answer this question? And then uh, uh, see if uh, Matt might agree with you. Yeah, I, I think that, yeah, I, I think it, it can. But also, I do think there's some internal efficiencies that the club can take to, to make that experience a little bit quicker and a little bit more prepared. And, you know, whether it's, you know, pre-wrapped sandwiches or, you know, quick to go items or, you know, things that they can offer up. Um, I think there does need to be a little bit of consciousness between the beverage cart person and the groups and the pace of play in general. Um, but it, I, I don't know, I'd say if it outweighs, but I think it, it definitely could have a, a negative impact if it was, um, you know, if it was, if it was negatively delaying the groups behind them. But in the in the desert where you want to stay hydrated, I think it's an important component if you're offering that that service for sure. Um, is that something that uh, you have at uh, Terra Vita, and how do you build it into your uh, pace of play strategy? Uh, we actually don't, uh, so we don't have any beverage carts out here. We have uh, halfway houses, um, mm -hmm. so we have one on the backside of nine between nine and ten. Uh, and then we have uh, two comfort stations with just water and, and cold towel service um, on uh, holes four or I guess five T box and 15 T box. So um, I can't really speak to too much on that, but I would say that David is probably pretty spot on with um, timeliness and almost um, it probably falls a little bit into the training as well from a beverage card standpoint. You know, I can't tell you how many times that I've seen or played behind slower groups um, and, and where the beverage cart positions themselves potentially on, you know, the backside of the green or right there on the tee box. And, you know, th that it just causes more of a log jam that doesn't need to necessarily happen. Yeah, cool. Exactly. Uh, I would go to I would go back to Peter Drucker here and say like you can actually measure the impact and you can look for the optimal position. Uh, but uh, what we've seen a lot of um, operators do is uh, they actually equip the drinks cart with their own tablet or it gives give them access to um, the software so they can see players approaching um, and. Uh, potentially also position themselves uh, a bit smarter where there's more more play happening and, and some have outright said to the drink squad okay if there's a big bunch up of players go to the groups that are delayed because you can see that they they're orange and give them a bit of extra service so that uh, they um, are not quite as disgruntled as um, the waiting on the tea box right at least they're getting a, a drink with it so um there's uh, there's opportunities um around this um and also the halfway house right uh, you can see down here that there's a halfway house time allotment and there's efficiencies to be gained here too especially when the with food and beverage and there's another question that's coming in uh, do you offer food and beverage pre-ordering on course so that is something that uh, tag marshall certainly um uh it does uh, because what we can do is we can have a, a geofenced uh, advert that um you know showcases the the offers from the halfway um at maybe 10 15 minutes ahead of time 
and triggers uh, that uh, as the groups pass into into that a certain zone and then we want to obviously encourage a, a pre-order and um, and then again the halfway house is tuned in they can see the players approaching on their screen and then they can have uh, whatever's been pre-ordered ready and that helps the turn time um, so all of these little things, like Matt said, the incremental, um, we even had uh, yeah, our, our friends from Pinehurst at one of their courses, they had major variance in their halfway um, turn, or turn times, and they didn't know why. And then they realized that uh, depending on who's on shift um, to make hot dogs, uh, they just took their sweet time. And then they realized, well, let's get a hot dog maker and then we can automate. Um, and uh, they said it made a major difference um, and it's little things right but if you get lots of little things right you have a big impact in the end uh, so I hope we got to those questions uh, but uh, it's all um, it's all sounding easy in hindsight right but uh, question how did you go about getting member buy-in and uh, how have they responded to the technology now that it's been going for a while uh, here's some of the notes that we had in our in our pre-chat so what was your silver bullet? How did you get, because very often members have got a lot of opinions, especially maybe the slower ones, um, but uh, how did you go about it? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess, you know, we have um, we have sort of pre-season annual meetings uh, where we invite the, the vast majority of the membership to attend. And um, we obviously have an agenda, but then we open it up for a Q and A and, you know, my year one and introducing myself, but then, you know, hearing a lot of the comments and, and what uh, was really the hot topics on everybody's mind, you know, it painted the picture pretty quickly to me that um, I don't have any data to back up truly what pace of play looks like at Terravita or how to even take a stab at managing it. Um, and so that was um, an eye opener um, and one area that I really felt like I needed to tackle. Um and so then, you know, doing my homework, calling about uh, to other clubs to see what sort of softwares that they use, um, you know, reading online, um, you know, all these other avenues to try to uh, gain more knowledge. Um, and, and actually, it wasn't until um, I believe you guys partnered with Golf Genius because I was so familiar with Golf Genius that I was kind of like, well, what is Tag Marshall? And so then I started to to research Tag Marshall a little bit and, and read up on uh, what your guys' vision was and what your guys' offerings were. Um, and that's what really started the conversation with me, with one of your representatives, um, and then allowed me to present this information to my general manager and then socialize it amongst the golf committee, then onto the board of directors, and then out to the membership to, so, to showcase to them that, you know, this is what we're going towards because we need a solution for uh, the problem that we do have, um, and this one best fits our needs. Um, yeah, what we're finding very often, and uh, I think you, uh, you're quite right in putting the player experience benefit um, in focus first, because obviously that's where the buy needs to come from. And, and quite frankly, very often the players, uh, they don't really care if it makes your day easier, right? <laughs> they, they want to know what's in it for us. And if you start there, that's probably a, a good starting point. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I would say the majority of our partners, and they know or um, they would tell you that they never had a pace of play problem, but they realize how important it is to their players. So they wanted to, uh, wanted to do it better than the course down the road. And they wanted to use it as a competitive advantage and also um, be mindful and respectful of the, the team that needs to run the show, right? Because it's really not an easy thing uh, to do. Um, and uh, yeah, then you, you switch it on and then you, you can't go back once, once you have had that, uh, that level of oversight and information. Um, I promise to keep us on pace and uh, we are now, um, we got two or three more minutes and I want to just encourage maybe another question or two from the audience if if you would like uh, we'll try and answer uh, but maybe just as a closing thought um, Matt what other value do you hope to unlock uh, going forward and here's one of those heat maps that you mentioned earlier we, uh, yeah. we know that uh, might might come in handy down the road especially yeah. in Arizona yeah I think that that's kind of the big one right i think that's uh you know we have a fantastic superintendent um but uh our ability to again work smarter not harder and 
and uh, see it in sort of real life and, and live data um, where our inefficiencies are with watering in Arizona, uh, because it will be and will continue to be a challenge. Um, and so I think that that's kind of our next step in unlocking um, and, and utilizing Tag Marshall to the best of its abilities. Um, since we already have this software, we use it for a lot of golf operations um, uh, portions of what we do, uh, but uh, tying it into the agronomy side of things. Um, you know, can we can we see where the traffic is really entering and exiting um, on hole number three or hole number 16 or what have you? Um, because, you know, that stuff is important for us and um, it will improve on the course conditions. Uh, it will allow for our superintendent to uh, probably not overwater the golf course and have some some savings, uh, some conservation there. Um, so, you know, I think that those like that is one of the next steps that we will take um, in, in the upcoming future. Um, thanks, Matt. Maybe David, um, uh, um, maybe share the agnostic nature of what we do, because there might be other uh, um, facilities like Matt's where, um, and, and we have many of them that are saying, well, we can actually put this sort of tech into all of our cards, even the private cards and um, our greenkeeping fleet. Correct. Yeah, I, I think, again, going back to the overall appeal um, photos, just the ability to be able to look at it from whatever, you know, I think what Matt's done a great job of is just prioritizing where his needs were. His need originally was on pace of play experience and as he evolved in the golf genius integration, but now he's evolving into how do we leverage this from an agronomy standpoint and how do we look at it from a course setup standpoint and entry and exit point and uh, doing, doing all the right things. And, and, you know, the one thing about this system is incrementally it's continuous improvement. It's really based on your ability to be able to leverage it over time and you don't get all the feature benefits and leverage them all, all at once. So I think the ability to be able to um, to be able to appeal to, you know, walkers, riders, all cart manufacturers, um, you know, being able to look at this holistically golf maintenance operations, Marshall, you know, across all of the, the segments of your of your golf operation just is where the appeal comes and you know kudos to max I, I think going back to what i really like about what we said earlier matt is that you know it, as you as you bridge this and you um you sold it to the membership and you sold it to your board and you and you got buy-in you know what does that do that really kind of embeds it in your culture going forward so now it's an expectation and now it's uh it's not a point of confrontation within your your operation it's a, it's a point of hey how are we doing how are we improving what can we do better? And uh, it's uh, really, really says a lot for your leadership. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, maybe just one more uh, consideration here. It's obviously, uh, we know that not everyone's a data scientist and it's uh, it's something that you need to learn and, and get into a bit, but uh, our team is there for that exactly. And uh, Matt, you mentioned it, that uh, you, you have regular check-ins and then they generate reports and they walk through it with you because um, there's always more to learn um, and maybe on that note also um, Baxter mentioned that uh, Joey Walters our GM he's uh, over in our Atlanta office he'll be at uh, that event um, in your guys backyard next week uh, so go and look out for him uh, he's the nicest guy you'll meet and uh, um, yeah, obviously uh, David's uh, details if you'd like to reach out and uh, we have just moved from um, one side of Atlanta to the other so this is our brand new address if you have an area come see us <laughs> we're in uh, um, yeah so uh, thank you gents um, there's uh, a quick shout out a note to say thank you for your time from Ross thank you so much um, thanks everyone for your time thanks for checking in um, what uh, do people need to know about the PDR credits or is that all going to happen by email afterwards i'm just asking for a friend i'm asking for matt he wants to <laughs> <laughs> um i think uh baxter may he may have jumped off a little earlier so i'm, I'm sure that i'm sure they've got that narrow nailed down yeah okay no actually natalie does this she, she sends um okay. for my marketing team she sends attendance list and checks that everyone stay till the end um and then uh 
the, um, the, the section does the rest. Okay, so I think then we're good. Um, yeah, uh, Matt, thank you so much. Been fantastic to have you on and uh, really great to get your insight. Um, David, thank you for helping me out and asking lots of questions and uh, sharing a little bit of your experience too. Uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, Matt, thank you so much. Thanks for your, no, thanks, thanks for your time. I, I really you. appreciate it. All right. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. And we'll share the recording um, in the next day or two once we have it. It's been great thanks, to chat. Bob. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. Have a great afternoon. Cheers.